So, Professor Adami, what is epidemiology? Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and the causes of disease, with the overarching goal to improve public health through the most offensive approach we can think of, namely through prevention of disease to occur altogether. And in order to do that, we need to understand the causes of disease and be able to eliminate them, with smoking and lung cancer as one of the classic examples. In order to do that, in order to understand the causes of disease, we often need to study very, very large groups of people and follow them over extended periods of time. Registries is one tool, uh, one of many possible, but often the most cost-effective that allows us to provide timely answers to burning research and public health questions. Are these just medical uh, registers or are the registers also collected originally for other purposes? In most instances, the registers we used are initially uh, collected for other purposes and then it turns out that they can be used uh, in a very f effective manner to answer emerging research questions. And of course, research questions and public health concerns, they can never be predicted in advance. If, if they could, we would start studying them now. Um, so having access to these registers, rather than starting from zero when, when the concern arises, saves a lot of time and it saves also enormous amounts of money. So in a timely and a cost-effective manner, we can often provide uh, very reliable answers to important questions. That must make it very difficult to ask for prior consent if you use already, already existing registers. I would say in most instances, virtually all instances, it's impossible because emerging research questions, emerging public health concerns, they cannot be predicted. And, and one, uh, of many, many examples is the, uh, the alarm that oral contraceptive causes breast cancer that was published in the mid-1980s. And we were able to provide a, a robust answer to that and, and address that concern in just two years' time uh, by using the cancer register. But of course, when that register began in 1958, oral contraceptives didn't even exist. So it would have been absolutely impossible to ask for, for consent. And what about the possibility of opt-outs? If people are uh, allowed to withdraw consent uh, over time, what happens then to the registers? That has two potential consequences. One is that we reduce the numbers and we lose power and therefore our conclusions be become less robust. Um, a more problematic uh, possible consequence is that those who opt out is a, a selected group and that that will uh, influence our results and make them misleading. Is there even a risk that you can come to the wrong conclusions, that your, your results may be harmful? It is, and uh, this, so, so this will, would certainly undermine the quality of the research we can produce. Thank you, Professor Adami. Thank you. So, Professor Julien Sirath, you are chairman of the committee that awards the Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. How do you see research in medicine and what is that triggers the breakthroughs? Well, part of the triggers are coming to the problems you address with an open mind and having the right resources and tools to help you achieve the goals you set. And what I've experienced is that oftentimes some of the biggest discoveries are the accidents that occur either in the laboratory or, you know, the unexpected. So I think a good researcher has to keep their mind to the open, to the unexpected. Essentially that's what we do. This is discovery. We're meant to go where no one else has gone before and then move forward on those unique discoveries we, we find. Is it possible then to define all the components of a research project already before you start it? Some of these components you have at your hand. Generally there's a large body of literature that informs you and helps you to develop a hypothesis. We often have specific tools at our hands that we, we're, we're able to use to be able to address the questions. Um, many times we, we collaborate with other teams and we always have that set up in advance. But there's the unexpected. And one particularly unique thing that we have in Europe and in Scandinavia are large databases. 
And this is very unique. It helps us to address questions in large populations over time. Uh, I know that you spoke uh, earlier about a study done of, of, uh, of the population in Övrekollegs. Can you tell us a bit about that? All right, so um, I'm interested in epigenetics. And one of the most uh, interesting studies that I've come across is a study that was performed in a population of Swedes in a town called Överkalax, and this is in the northern part of Sweden. And this study is unique because they followed the health of families over several generations. And what they found was that if your grandfather or grandmother had restricted food access, this affected your health. So without having access to these databases, we wouldn't have been able to appreciate that the nutritional status of our grandparents has a major impact on our own health. In order to do this, we needed these registries, we needed databases, and we needed to study these families and their children and their grandchildren over several generations. Because of that, we now understand that there's a component to our health called epigenetics or transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. We couldn't have done this without these registries. So that means you have to keep the registries over a long time as well? Absolutely, because you don't know how many generations this effect can last. And on top of genetics, epigenetics can affect our health. What about peer review? Do you need to keep the registries after research for peer review as well? Well, this is really essential. I think every citizen files a tax return and we save that at home. Registries are our accounting tool. So we have all of our clinical data. We have all of the parameters that we're interested in. We need to save that. I gave you the example of Övekalux. We can go back to these registries. We can learn more from the populations and their offspring over time. We also need to keep the registries so that other people can come in and they can replicate our results. And we also need them so that we may be able to develop a new hypothesis going forward. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll have more information about biology that allows us to go back into a register and ask a new question. So they're really valuable. They're really unique resources that are so unique to Europe. And I think we need to preserve those resources. And uh, when you sit on this as chairman of this Nobel Committee, what do you look for then in research that is groundbreaking and, and merits a, a Nobel Prize? So um, we first follow the will of Alfred Nobel. And in his will, he expressed that the prize in medicine or physiology should go for a discovery, not an improvement, not an advancement. So the first thing we look for is, is there a discovery? Then we really look to see who made that discovery. And then we ask if we took that person out of the picture, the deletion test, would this discovery have been made? And so we look for that and we ask then, is that discovery of a paradigm shifting nature? What do we know now because of that discovery that really advanced medicine or physiology? And then finally, Will, um, Nobel expressed an interest in having these discoveries that conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. And so we also take that into our equation. Is this discovery of a uh, height that really has had an effect on, on mankind? Thank you very much, Professor Zero.